stream sings a lullaby, there grows a lily fair. I'm Janice Kelly and I work at the information desk. I know some of you have probably seen me. And I'm happy to introduce Patrick Taylor, a well-known author, sailor, and a physician. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of his bio. Uh, I'm going to tell the date when he was born. He was born in 1941 and brought up in Bangor County down in Ireland. He received his medical education in Ulster. He initially practiced in a rural uh, Ulster village similar to Valley Buckle Bone for taking specialist training in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, in the 1970s, he and his family emigrated to Canada and he worked and taught in the field of human infertility. This talent for writing was recognized early on at age 16 when he won the Campbellian Prize for Literature. His academic works include 170 papers and six textbooks. He turned his hand to writing medical humor columns in uh, 1991 and was book reviewer for Stitches, the Journal of Medical Humor. Which is no longer published, by the way. <laughs> I'm sad about that. In the mid-90s, encouraged by his longtime friend Jack White, author of the Dream of Eagle series, Patrick began to write serious fiction. A book of short stories, only wounded, Ulster Stories was published by Key Porter Books of Toronto in 1997. Two techno thrillers followed, uh, Pray for Us Sinners and the sequel Now and in the Hour of Our Death. After his retirement from medicine, uh, he began working on his Irish Country series. Uh, the first three novels followed from 2007 to 2010. They became New York Times and USA Today and Globe and Mail bestsellers. An Irish Country Doctor, a Book of the Month Club novel of the month, was published in German, Dutch, Spanish, and Czech. He is presently working on book six of the series. No? Seven. Excellent. <laughs> An expert navigator, uh, Taylor's been a member of offshore racing crews. His race reports, including his account of a recent Victoria to Maui challenge compliment, his frequent contributions of sailing humor to voting magazines. Uh, Thank you very much. Now uh, it's time for you nice people to see the harsh reality of who I really am. <laughs> the gentleman who bewails the death of stitches. Uh, you're right, I miss it too, but they had actually fired me before. So they did a, a demographic survey and decided that my you got fired? Oh, yeah. my Good. They, they, told, they gave you your papers? And oh, said absolutely. They said that Those didn't cats. No wonder they're no longer in this. No, actually, it worked out very nicely because I was then able to concentrate on doing these things. I did much better, so it's okay. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here to, to Abbotsford. It is a great pleasure to be here. Um, I don't do these readings quite the way most authors do. I'm lazy. I will read to you a bit. But then I like to stop and field questions. So I find most people in the audience, some of them perhaps are writers. Some of them simply are curious about what makes a writer tick. And I think if we talk to each other, it's a lot more fun than <clears throat> me just going on for an hour, because probably you have the book, you can read it faster yourself anyway. But the truth of the matter is that I set off to write a series about um, two doctors. One of them, a crusty old boy who was born in 1908, he trained in 1930. He spent uh, six years on HMS Warspite, a famous 15-inch gun British battleship in the Second World War. His first wife was killed during the German Blitz in Belfast in 1941. Same year I was born, I was one of the first uh, neonatal transports to get away from the German bombs, not to open ICU. Um, and he's evolved his own style of practice, this man. He's joined by Barry Laverty, who is absolutely wet behind the ears, fresh out of medical school, literally doesn't know which ends up. <laughs> And that is what drives most of these books. There are a couple of sidetracks, I'll talk about them later. But I'd like to introduce you first 
to Barry's first office, called him surgery in Ireland, with the redoubtable Dr. O'Reilly. And all Barry gets to do is sit and watch the patients come in. <coughs> and O'Reilly sends him to get the next customer. Makes them a little glass of water. Barry walked to the door. He opened it to a woman in her 60s. Now, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. I have a bad habit of, of talking, as I normally do. No, nobody can hear me, which is probably to their advantage. Anyway, um, <laughs> her face was weathered as a piece of dried dulse, which, for those of you who don't know, is an edible seaweed. Her upper lip sported a fine brown moustache, her nose curved down, her chin curved up, like that of Punch in a Punch and Judy show. And when she smiled, you could see that she was toothless as an oyster. But her ebony eyes twinkled. She wore a straw hat with two wilted geraniums stuck in the hat band. Her torso was hidden under layers of different coloured woolen cardigans, and under the hem of her rusty ankle length skirt, keep the toes of a pair of Wellington boots. Is himself in? she inquired. Barry felt a presence at his shoulder. Maggie, he heard O'Reilly say, Maggie, of course, come on in, come on in. Barry remembered Mrs. Kincaid, the housekeeper, mentioning the name at breakfast. The new arrival pushed past him. O'Reilly ushered her to the patient's chair and went and sat on the examining couch and said, this is my assistant, Dr. Laverty. I'd like him to see you this morning, Maggie. There's nothing like a second opinion. Barry stared at O'Reilly, nodded, and strode to the swivel chair. Good morning, Mrs. McCorkle, he started. She sniffed and smoothed her skirt. It's Miss McCorkle, she said. Barry glanced to where O'Reilly sat, arms folded, expressionless. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Miss McCorkle. And what seems to be the trouble? It was her turn to glance at O'Reilly before she said, the headaches. I see, Barry said, when did they start? Oh, Lord, Jesus, they've always been acute. Last night they became something chronic, so they did it. This is something we always do wrong in the North of Ireland. A medical condition as acute as one that's just come on like that, something chronic you've had for weeks. Uh-uh, not in Belfast. It's acute if it lasts for more than two weeks. It's chronic if it really starts to hurt. So that's what might be different. And you have to speak Belfast to understand that. And she comes out with another expression from Belfast. It was so bad I nearly took the rickets. Rickets is a deficiency disease that takes you years to accumulate, not in Belfast. Things are bad, oh God, I took the rickets. <coughs> he stifled a smile. I see, he said, and exactly, exactly where are the headaches? He was following the classical history-taking protocol, like a minor bureaucrat hewing to his rule book. She whispered conspiratorially, there. She held one hand above the crown of her head. Barry jerked back in his chair. No wonder O'Reilly had sighed when Mrs. Kincaid announced Maggie was coming. He wondered where O'Reilly kept the forms for certifying that someone wasn't completely at the match. <laughs> Above your head? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I. Good two inches. I see. <coughs> he steepled his fingers. And, and have you been hearing voices lately? <laughs> she stiffened. What do you mean? Well, I, he looked helplessly to O'Reilly, who slipped down off the couch. <coughs> what Dr. O'Reilly means is, do you have any ringing in your ears, Maggie? <coughs> Ding dong or <coughs> ring? <laughs> Maggie asked, hitching herself up in the chair and turning to O'Reilly. You tell me, he said. Ding dong, doctor dear, she said. O'Reilly smiled at her over his half new spectacles. Clearly encouraged, she continued. Ding dong it is. Dingy dingy dong. <laughs> Not a description of the woman herself, Barry thought, but kept the thought to himself. Hmm, said O'Reilly, looking wise. Hmm. Ding dong, and two inches above. Now, are the pains in the middle, or are they off to one side? <coughs> Over to the left, so they are. Now, that's what we would call eccentric, Maggie. That's what I call the pair of you, back of those. <laughs> eccentric. Why, is it here? Is that bad, doctor? Not that tall, said O'Reilly. 
laying a comforting hand on her shoulder. We'll fix her up in no time. Her shoulders relaxed. She smiled at her medical advisor, but when she turned to Barry, her stare was as icy as the wind that sweeps the loch in the sun. O'Reilly leant past Barry, grabbed a plastic bottle of vitamin tablets from the desk and said, these will do the trick. Maggie rose and accepted the bottle. O'Reilly gently propelled her toward the door. These are special, Maggie, he said. She nodded. You have to take them exactly, exactly as I tell you. Yes, Dr. Sir, how does that be? O'Reilly held the door for her. You take them half an hour, he said, and his next words were delivered with weighted solemnity. You take them exactly half an hour before the pain starts. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Dear. Her smile was radiant. She made a little curtsy, turned and faced Barry, but she spoke to O'Reilly. Her departing words stung like the jab of a wasp. Mind you, she said, this young lover, do you feel him? He's got a lot to learn, so he has. <laughs> <laughs> so there is an introduction to the slightly off-center world of Dr. Fingal Flaherty O'Reilly. And the poor, bewildered Barry. How Barry keeps us up for six books is beyond me. <laughs> and like a lovesick lad am I, she has my heart in thrall.